Our uh, final speaker on this panel is uh, Professor Stephen Morse. And I, I also wanted to note, I know there are probably a lot of questions that you have. We're going to um, let Stephen speak. All of the panelists will then come up, and we'll open it up for discussion and questions. Um, Dr. Morse is a professor of law and of psychology and, and psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the foremost scholar at the intersection of neuroscience and law. To give you a sense, if you like what Tavi said, Stephen has trained Tavi. If you like what we're doing, Stephen has trained me. Um, it is uh, a really a wonderful that Stephen's here. He's come all the way from New York, so coast to coast. Um, I would encourage you to read his bio and to read his work, um, and I don't think I can do him justice, so I won't say any more except uh, to say we're really happy to have you here, Stephen. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Francis. You know, I was once at a conference in, um, in Lausanne, it was, what's new under the skull? That's the translation. And they had one of the great neurosurgeons there, uh, a guy from Paris. And he was the guy who first did deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, which, as you know, is now an accepted, uh, accepted technique for certain cases of Parkinson's. And he had two of his students in the audience who were the next generation. He said, they're much better than I am. So Tavi and Francis, they're much better than I am. <laughs> All right, come on. Go cursor. OK. I'm, because I've only been given a limited amount of time, have much more in the slides than I will be able to say. But here's what I can tell you. If you're interested enough, you can email me, and I will send you the slides. No problem at all. And in the briefing book, in my description, there is an art chapter of mine that was just published, really, this past month, that makes the full argumentation. The book is very expensive, so I hope you'll buy it. OK. <laughs> now, uh, what I skipped over briefly uh, was a moral fable from real life. This, for the lawyers, will know. This is Leroy Powell, who was the uh, appellant in the case of Powell against Texas, which the Supreme Court decided in 1968, the most important case about intoxication, and alcoholism, that's been decided. What the Supreme Court was being asked to decide was this. Was a compulsion symptomatic of the disease of alcoholism? And again, think about the logic of it. Should any compulsion symptomatic of a disease, because you couldn't limit it to alcoholism, not really, should any compulsion symptomatic of a disease that produced criminal behavior, should it be excused? Right? And this was all a test case set up in Austin, Texas. Uh, there's a particular court in Austin that basically if you lose, you, the defendant, lose, you go straight to the Supreme Court of the United States. There's no other way to get an appeal. So this was all a setup, right? And Leroy Powell was, you'll excuse me, a chronic, broken down, severe alcoholic. He was drunk all the time, OK? So at his trial, he tests. First of all, there's all this expert testimony. It's a disease. He can't help himself. Maybe he has certain control over the first drink, but once he takes that first drink, he can't stop. Right? So he was cross-examined because that's what he said about himself. You know, once I take that first drink, I can't stop. So as Tavi read it out, this is so good. I love this. I'm going to read it out. So now here's the prosecutor cross-examining Powell. You have it on the screen. You took that one drink at 8 o'clock this morning because you wanted to drink. Yes, sir. And you knew that if you drank it, you could keep on drinking and get drunk. Well, I was supposed to be here on trial, and I didn't take but that one drink. You knew you had to be here this afternoon, but this morning you took one drink, and then you knew that you couldn't afford to drink anymore and come to court. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's right. Because you knew what you would do if you kept drinking, that you would finally pass out or be picked up. Yes, sir. And you didn't want that to happen to you today. No, sir. Not today. No, sir. So you only had one drink today. Yes, sir. OK, redirect examination. Obviously, this is testimony that hurts his case. So his own lawyer, a public defender, is going to re-examine him on redirect. Leroy, isn't the real reason why you just had one drink today because you just had enough money to buy one drink? Well, that was just give to me. Now, it must have been his lawyers that gave it to him, I suppose. In other words, you didn't have any money with which you could buy drinks yourself. No, sir, that was give to me. And that's really what controlled the amount you drink this morning, isn't it? Yes, sir. Leroy, when you start drinking, do you have any control over how many drinks you can take? No, sir. 
So here's what I'd like to suggest in light of the first two things you heard. People have ignored the clear treatment for addictions. Poverty. <laughs> OK. I know many of you are in the, in, the, uh, in the audience are lawyers, but many are not. So just to start off, I want to give you the very brief lay of the land about what the law's doctrines are about addiction and drugs generally. And, and it, not just addiction, but intoxication. Now, obviously, lots of people who are intoxicated when they get into the criminal justice system are not addicts. But addicts, let's assume, are disproportionately likely to be intoxicated. All right, first, we criminalize all aspects of drug use with the controlled substances, even though they may not be more dangerous, let's say, than nicotine or alcohol. And by the way, when I teach my criminal law students, I always call it ethanol, because I want them to understand it's a drug like any other drug. In fact, in some ways, it's a worse drug. Uh, so we now have a criminal justice approach. Secondly, with very, very, very rare exception, and in some states, no exception whatsoever, and in most of the Anglo-American criminal justice system, no exception, addiction or even intoxication is not a mitigating or an excusing condition at all. The best you might hope for in the United States, for example, in, for instance, you cannot use it. Some states it's excluded by statute for an insanity defense. No matter how crazy you might have been while you were intoxicated, won't lead to insanity defense unless you have what's called settled insanity, where you're chronically mentally ill as a result of persistent substance abuse. Then you can raise the insanity defense, but not just for an acute episode or anything of the sort. So we're very unforgiving. And the third thing, as many of you know, we have drug courts, which are used for diversion in nonviolent crimes. In some jurisdictions, they are uh, compelled. In most jurisdictions, they are optional. In other words, the defendant can decline to take part in a diversion program and just through, go through the criminal justice system. They are, uh, and I know many people are true believers in them. Many people are true critics of them. They're controversial, but they are an absolutely central feature of our approach to drug use and nonviolent crime. Now. I have four theses that I couldn't possibly argue in depth. And this is not on the slide, so don't look. I have four theses that I'm going to argue for. If you want the full argumentation in the chapter I have cited for you in the materials, uh, you can find the full argumentation. The first thesis is how addiction should be understood is not settled at present and that there are a range of options, all of which have things to be said in their behalf, including the addiction is a brain disease model. There is a lot to be said in its behalf, but there is a lot to be said against it, and I'll be talking about later. And the reason that's particularly important for the criminal justice system is how you perceive the agent in front of you, the wrongdoer, the potential criminal, how you want to respond to that person is to a large degree going to be affected by how you think that person's capacities have been affected by conduct, brain changes, whatever. The second major thesis is that the criminal law as it now stands, unforgiving as it is, is defensible. Now, when I say defensible, I mean weakly defensible in the following sense. Given that the study of addiction is still unsettled in terms of how we should understand the phenomenon conceptually, it is perfectly plausible to say the law should be conservative. So for example, in Powell against Arizona, which by the way refused to adopt the defense, Justice Marshall, one of the great liberal justices, writing for a plurality, that means he didn't get a full five votes, but he got, with one additional concurring vote, he got enough votes to get the opinion, basically said, asking us on the basis of the current state of knowledge to adopt this one-size-fits-all compulsion defense based on disease goes too far. And what I would like to suggest was, although that was close to 50 years ago, asking the law to adopt one or another particular response to addiction and intoxication still goes too far on too little. The law is very conservative now, and maybe that's the right way to go until our knowledge base increases. Now, having said that, I should say, 
If Morse was in charge, we'd do a lot of things differently. We'd be moving much more to decriminalization of certain kinds of drug-related behaviors. We'd be moving towards a much more public health approach to them and things like that. Having said that, I still think the criminal justice response is at least defensible. Okay. The way I think about addiction, and I'm going to say more about this, this is my third thesis is, and this is where treatment has to be approached. Given the changes, and by the way, the kinds of phenomenological, behavioral sorts of changes that Dr. Compton talked about, I have two slides on. I just adopt by reference everything he said. So where you have people with impaired decision making but strong appetite to use drugs, how are you going to get them to stop? And I'm talking about those who will not stop spontaneously or with treatment. You have to somehow do something to give them a good enough reason not to use drugs anymore. It's not enough, in a sense, to stop them to begin with. Something has got to replace it. Because when you get to the stage of addiction, this becomes your life. It's who you are. It's how you self-identify. It's how you spend vast amounts of your time. And I know there is decreased reward, but there is reward. And moreover, there is some reward about being an addict altogether as a holistic, biopsychosocial person, right? And unless you give them a reason, which is why, by the way, these programs, the health programs that were mentioned with physicians, there are similar programs. Local bar associations tend to run them for lawyers. And there are airline pilots. You know, you get them clean and keep them clean long enough. If you can give them a good reason to stay clean while they are abstinent, they're going to stay clean at a much higher rate. Now, obviously, what do doctors, lawyers, and airline pilots have going for them? They have a particularly good life with lots of human capital that's going to produce all sorts of goodies for them if they stay clean. You know, think about how hard it's going to be to provide a good reason to somebody who's grown up in poverty, deprivation, has no human capital, very few human resources. How do you provide reasons to those people? All right. The last, and this is somewhat deviant from what you've been hearing, although I think actually Dr. Compton's slides sort of reinforce this. Most of the work in the legal system and in the prevention approaches we're now doing, despite the advances that Dr. Fireman talked about, is going to be done psychosocially and behaviorally. It's not going to be done by neuroscience. Neuroscience is not going to fix these problems for us yet. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know what's going to be reported tomorrow. But as of now, we have a lot of understanding of the correlates of addiction. We have an understanding of what sorts of parts of the brain are compromised. But notice when you went through that Volko and all slide that Dr. Compton did with the three stages of addiction, we could have described those behaviorally. We didn't need neuroscience to describe. I mean, it's very interesting that we now know. We knew all about impaired judgment, impaired decision making. Impulse, this is old news, old behavioral news. And if you notice the three programs that he talked about that really, and I agree entirely, are enormously optimistic, they were all behavioral programs. They weren't drug programs. Now, obviously, drug programs have their place. And Dr. Fireman talked about the success of methadone, which is a really good one. All right, so that's, once again, the four theses, how addiction should, not be, should be understood, not well settled, criminal law defensible, but should be reformed, addicts need to have good reasons to stop being addicts, and lastly, neuro, at present, I want to stress at present, is not going to be doing most of the work. Something else is going to be doing most of the work. And interestingly enough, if you look at, for instance, the success of methadone, which has been around for a very, very long time, that wasn't the new neuroscience that's got everybody so excited. You know, that's the old stuff, right? All right, now, <clears throat> what you need to understand is the law of psychology. And I'm going to do this. I am going to be breathtakingly, stupendously superficial. All right? <clears throat> 
The law is a system of rules and standards that's meant to guide behavior. That's its primary function. It's like morality. It's like custom. It's like norms. It's like etiquette. All rules, as we live together as acting human beings, to live together. Now, what kinds of creatures can be guided by rules? The kinds of creatures that actually can be guided by reason. Re rules give us reasons to do things. We don't have to follow them, but they give us a reason to do something. And what kind of creature is that? That's a creature that's capable of rationality and the like. All right. Now, what are we talking about? And for those of you who are mental health professionals or psychologists, we're talking about a folk psychological creature. And that is not a pejorative for those in the room who don't know the word. It's a technical uh, term in the philosophy of mind and action that simply says, if you're trying to give a full explanation of human behavior, a full explanation, it's got to be multi-field, multi-level. You're going to have to have biological variables. You're going to need psychological variables. And you're going to need sociological variables. But what the folk psychological theory insists on is if you want a complete explanation, you're going to need an explanation in terms of mental states. If I were a simple explanation, suppose I were to ask you all, why are you in this room today? You're going to tell me a story along the lines of, I desired to learn something about reentry. I desired to learn something about addiction. I believed if I went to this program, I would learn something about it, and you formed the intent to be here. Some ancillaries, I desired to see some of my friends. I decided to suck up to certain people, whatever it is. And you, know, and you believed you could achieve those goals by coming here, and here you came. We are the only creatures, to the best of our knowledge, to whom you can ask the question, why did you do that? You don't ask. Porpoises, you don't ask. Chimps, gorillas, bonobos, birds, only human beings. All right. <clears throat> so what's the translation going to be? The translation is always going to be from any form of science, whether it's neuroscience or genetics or anything else, to the folk psychological categories of the law. And the law's categories, especially in criminal law, are all acts and mental states. Every single criminal law doctrine is acts and mental states. And so you're going to have to move from, if you're doing um, either genetics or you're doing neuro, you're going to have to move from, and I'm not denying for second gene by environment interactions or anything of the sort, but moving purely from neuro or genetics to acting human beings is going to be a hard translation. Whereas psychology and psychiatry, and this is why I'm giving a talk tomorrow at the American Academy of Forensic Psychiatry's annual meeting. My talk is called Indispensable Forensic Psychiatry. Because if, you know, an fMRI does not tell you why. And psychology and psychiatry sometimes treat you like a hunk of meat. And sometimes they treat you like an acting human being. Even if you go to a pill doc for your depression, for example, if she doesn't ask you, How's it going at work? How's it going at home? Tell me about your life. She ain't doing her job right. Fire her. Find somebody new. So psychiatry and psychology are much more both folk psychological and non-folk psychological. Translation is easier. OK, here's an important point, and it's under number two on the slide. Just because something is a sign or a symptom of what, let's assume for a moment, arguably, is a mental disorder or any other kind of disease, it doesn't mean it's excusable. The law has its own excusing or mitigating conditions, and you have to prove those behaviorally. And if you think about the importance of that for a second, well, first let me do my definition of addiction. I have a slightly different one. And interestingly enough, it's, I think it's, it's a better one to use in general. And many of the people whose names you saw at the bottom of the slides from scientific studies use it themselves. And essentially, it's persistent seeking and using of substances. And I put engaging in other activities in question mark because there's a real question whether things like gambling at a certain level or video gaming should be considered addictions. I, for one, by the way, am in the camp that says they should be. But it's still controversial. And it suggests that the use of, is compulsive. It's often associated with subjective craving. Not always. 
and often at great interpersonal, medical, economic, and legal costs to the user. Not always, but very often, okay? So, how do we know it's compulsive? We don't know it's compulsive because we see brain changes. Compulsion is something that you have to assess behaviorally. The only way you know what brain changes are associated with compulsion is because you've already got a group of subjects who you know are compulsive. You know, the neuro isn't going to be any better than the behavior you are relating it to. So we've already got a good definition of compulsive. Well, what is it? Well, they use it at great interpersonal, medical, economic, and legal cost themselves. And what you're doing is a common sense reverse induction. Why would they continue doing that when they say they don't want to, and it's really sending their life down the tubes? And that's a damn good question. And it's a perfectly common sense answer to say, well, they can't, or else they wouldn't keep doing these things. All right. I'm going to skip over that. Here are the three models, I think, that are out there. Two of them, I think, are starters. One is a non-starter. The first you've already heard about. It's a chronic and relapsing brain disease. The danger of that, of course, is the lure of mechanism, of mechanistic thinking. But remember, if someone's not seeking and using drugs, they're not an addict at the moment. You may want to say they're recovered. You may want to say they're in remission. But if they're not seeking and using, they're not addicted at that point. So, it's actions that are crucial for the diagnosis. And once we think, gee, these actions are the sign of a disorder, the people can't help themselves. You have to show that they can't help themselves independently. Is addiction a moral weakness, as many people believe? I don't think so. I don't think there's any evidence for it. I understand the point people are trying to make, but to me, that's a non-starter. Here's my preferred view. It's a habit, a really bad habit, really bad habit, that is potentiated by biological, psychological, and sociocultural variables, some of which may be pre-existing, many of which may be caused by the persistent use of the substances or activities. And it's very hard to break for most addicts under ordinary circumstances, very, very hard. And you know, like Henry Kissinger still bites his nails. <laughs> And I'm sure he would rather he didn't bite his nails. All right. I'm going to just quickly skip over. Francis, can I have a few extra minutes? Thank you. You know, let the old codger go on, you know. <laughs> All right. I want to go immediately to, because what I was just citing, there were a bunch of really well-regarded statements of the brain disease model. I've said I'm not a brain disease guy. By the way, I should say I'm, not, I'm agnostic. I don't know. I'm not sure. For now, I think that the really bad habit potentiated, as I said, is probably the better way of going. Many of you are probably brain disease people. Uh, here are some inconvenient facts. The importance of set and setting, which Dr. Compton very ably laid out. Set being your pre-expectations, the setting being the kinds of environmental cues. So I'm fond of saying, if you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic, don't go home by McGinty's Bar, the root home. Go by the, the school playground, unless you're also a pedophile, which way you better find a, <laughs> you know, a, a third route. <laughs> Here's one of the problems with the samples of imaging of most, virtually all the studies you see that look at the brain differences between addicts and non-addicts. The sample is virtually always addicts in treatment. Addicts in treatment are not a representative sample of addicts. They are disproportionately comorbid. As a result, we don't know what's doing the work. Third, the sample for relapse is the same. Yes, ad uh, addicts in treatment are much more likely to relapse. Again, we don't know why, because they're disproportionately comorbid. So it's a little bit too hard to tease out what's doing what. Here's the most inconvenient fact. And this has been quite controversial, but I think that the data support it. It is the most spontaneously remitting major mental disorder there is, addiction. Most people quit, and they quit without treatment, which is a fascinating fact. And if it's a chronic and relapsing brain disease, how does that happen? No, it doesn't happen all at once. Typically, people make numerous attempts to quit, but then they do. 
Now, we don't have very good data about this, but anecdotally, what it looks like is they develop a good enough reason. I needed to look after my kids. My family was ashamed of me. I realized my life was going down the tubes. In fact, the, the best example I can give you of this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the writer Augustine Burroughs? 36 years old, about to die. I mean physically die from alcohol. He wakes up one morning and he says, I really want to be a writer. He decided he wanted to be a writer more than he wanted to be an alcoholic, and he just quit. And now he's in his 50s, very, very successful author. All right, let me move right to the very end. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave out so many steps in the argument. I could give you, I could give you so many uh, theories of why we should excuse and the like. Let me turn to the following questions. <clears throat> Here's one, and this is number 13. Synchronous versus diachronous responsibility. Even when an addict is in the, in the throes of peak craving and can't think of anything else, think about if you were that hungry or that thirsty. You can't think about anything else. He or she may not be a rational agent, and therefore you might say should be excused. But addicts aren't always in that position. Many times, they're quiescent. And when they're quiescent, unless they're so psychosocially disabled that they're not rational agents at all, they can be rational agents. And they can plan how to get their next fix. They spend a lot of time doing that and stuff like that. But they also know there are treatment programs underutilized and not nearly made available enough. I mean, the Affordable Health Care Act is going to help with that, and various other federal legislation, let's hope, is going to help with that. When they're quiescent, they know what's going to happen. They're going to get in trouble again. And it's their duty to take steps when they're quiescent. You know, if you know that you are an uncontrolled sufferer from epilepsy, and you could go into an ictal state at any time, you damn well better not get behind a car drive and drive a car and then claim when you black out and run into some people, gee, I wasn't acting at all. I was blacked out. Same sort of argument. Now, what I want to talk about last, and this is it, is the medical model and agency. And, and treatment and recidivism comes next. Here's what we don't know very well yet, and I wish we knew more. How does telling people their behaviors are the sign of an illness affect the experience of agency? I mean, people who do addiction treatment, I'm not an addiction treatment specialist, although I've treated addicts and wearing my other hat as a psychologist and not as a law professor. You know, on the one hand, we want them to think, if you're a medical modelist, that in fact, you're in the grips of something that's really not up to you. On the other hand, if they feel that unagentic, can they take the steps to straighten themselves out? Damnably hard to do, but it's sort of a rock and a hard place situation. We also don't know the effects on treatment if we tell people that. I mean, this would be, this would be very, very difficult research to do, but it would be very, very interesting to know how people sort of are told to think of themselves affects their outcome in treatment. And that, by the way, might be true of treatment by biological agents. It might be true treatment psychosocially and the like. OK, last slide. Well, you've heard a lot about the biological treatments. You've heard something about some of the psychosocial treatments. Again, I want to end where I started, which is whatever we do, and sometimes we can't do it for people. If they don't do it for themselves, it's not going to work. We've got to give them the space to find a good enough reason. So what I want to suggest now, and this is some of you who know me and know my work will find this absolutely shocking. With people who are addicts, whether addict addiction is a disease or a really bad, hard to break habit, as I've said, who've gotten into trouble with the law, I would all be for very paternalistic intervention. That is, I would say, you have to come into the treatment program. You have to be tested regularly. You have to stay clean. We're going to really ride you if you're not clean. Because unless they can be clean long enough, they're not going to find space to find those good reasons. The second problem is, which is why you need psychosocial counseling, vocational counseling. 
you've got to give them the capital to find a reason, especially if they're the most disadvantaged. And that's something we don't know how to do very well at all. Thank you.